Sometimes in life we just suffer. Sometimes it's from being totally withdrawn. Or so much stress that we are totally anxious. Or so tired that we are totally burnt out. But our current position is not our final destination. No, indeed. There's hope. So whether it's your personal life, your career, your relationship, your business, or your job, we say there's reason to believe again. And we present from Andy's personal development, the breakout room. It's the place for health, happiness, and prosperity. Stay tuned for more. Our next guest in the breakout room is a transformative coach, former pop star, entrepreneur, author, and founder of the non-profit organization United Global Shift. She is Jocelyn Herman Sachi. This is our guest. Her publications are So You Wanna Be a New York Actor The New York Actors Toolkit to Creating the Career of Their Dreams while paying the rent. And the promise effect how to create a life that wasn't going to happen anyway. She says, in my work with both individuals and organizations, I have had the honor of guiding many people through the empowering process of becoming unmessable with them. So Let's welcome this multi-talented and positive, transformative coach, Jocelyn Herman Sachi, live in the brick. So we are live in the breakout room, and this is Andy of Andy's Personal Development. And our special guest today is a woman of many dreams and many accomplishments. Her name is Jocelyn Herman Satchio. She's a transformative coach, former pop star, entrepreneur, author, founder of the nonprofit organization United Global Shift, wife and mother of three. Jocelyn, we welcome you to the breakout room. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Wonderful. Good to have you on. So, as I said before, you're a woman of many dreams and many accomplishments. But what I want to do is give you the opportunity to share with us your early childhood days, if you can recall growing up as a young lady. What was it like for you? Because basically, that's the foundation of our lives for the rest of it. Can you for sure. Yeah. Can you recall? Can you share with some, some, uh, some long-lasting memories with us? Absolutely. I can, I can share with you when I was five years old, you wow. know, my father used to paint. In fact, the painting behind me, he painted. And I noticed at five that he stopped painting. So we were sitting in our Chevy Impala 1966 convertible and he was smoking a cigar. And I said to him, daddy, why'd you stop painting? And he said, well, you can't do your art as your career. Wow. And in that moment, I mean, it wasn't so much he said that because he said a lot of things in my life that I didn't listen to. But when he said that, I said that to myself, you can't do your art as your career. And all I wanted was to be a singer. That was my dream. I would sing to my stuffed animals, to my dog, to anybody who would listen. Right. And in that moment, it was like, OK, I'm not going to do that. I guess I'll be a business person or I'll be a lawyer or something because that's what you do as a career now. I didn't remember that moment. It's not like every day I thought about that moment, but it became the truth. Yeah. So it was like a limiting belief that I gathered evidence for. And I knew a lot of people who wanted to be artists and they were starving. So I didn't want to be them. So I was like, definitely like, clearly this is the thing. Right. And years later, 
I was in a transformative workshop and all of a sudden that image of that moment came to me. Like I hadn't thought about it in, you know, 15 years. And all of a sudden I was like, what if that's not the truth? Uh -huh. yeah. What if that was a decision I made in the infinite wisdom of five yeah. and then just made it the truth? So it started to loosen mm -hmm. its grip. And within three weeks, I had a record deal wow. and that record went number one. So when you talk about dreams being fulfilled, one of the things that stops them from being fulfilled are limiting beliefs that aren't even true, but we live like they're true. Yep. That's very informative and it is so real and a whole lot of people need to hear that. Thanks for sharing, Justin. So let's talk about the hit record. Your group was called Boy Crazy. Yes, with a K, because we could sing but not spell, you know? <laughs> Where did that name come from? Well, I didn't create that name. That was already the name. I was cast in the group. So they had had four girls. They were trying to do a, a female version of New Kids on the Block, which might be before your time. I don't know. I'm, I think I'm older than you. And so we were like before the Spice Girls. We were like the prototype for the Spice Girls, right? Uh, so yeah. they... They needed one more girl, and I ended up being the, the fifth girl in that group. So it was an already put together group, almost like the days of Motown, you know, which was kind of yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. And it was with Polygram Records, and they were huge in that day. And yes. the song was That's What Love Can Do. Did you have any input in the, the lyrics or, or the writing of the song? It was just the casting that you got. It was just, yeah, we were singers. The writers are amazing writers. Stock Aiken and Waterman, they wrote most of Kylie Minogue's early hits and Banana Rama and Rick Astley. I mean, they were, they were pretty famous back then. They were called the hit makers. Okay. And they would go to lunch. They would say, okay, go to the pub. We, we recorded it in England. And they'd say, go to the pub and come back in an hour. And we'd come back and they would have written a chorus of a song and we'd just start recording it. They were amazingly prolific. So you went number one in America, replacing Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You? Yeah, they, she was number one for like 100 million weeks, if you remember this. It was during this time, it was like she was never going to not be number one. And we were the next number one, which was quite a claim to fame. You know, it was kind of amazing. How did that make you feel? Like a dream fulfilled. I mean, it was magical. It really was magical. I remember I met her once at Clive Davis's Grammy party when she was pregnant. Yeah. And I just was, you know, she's that voice was just, you know, heavenly. I mean, like a God given gift, you know, yes. and I just thought to myself, you know, if I could ever be in the same realm as her, and obviously I'm not in the same realm as her as a singer at all. But the fact that we were the following number one was sort of like, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for sharing, Jocelyn. So you began your career in 1986 as a producer for Xander's Animation Parlor. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I was very young. I was uh, 18 when I started working for that company as a receptionist, actually. And this goes back to the power of transformative work, I will tell you, because during the time I was a receptionist there, I did a transformative program and I saw that I had been sort of in that company until they couldn't pay my paycheck. You know, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll work here until they kind of go out of business because they weren't really doing very well. They had a lot of debt and I was kind of like lucky if I got my paycheck every week. But that was how I was like a leaf in the wind of whatever was going to happen. And I did this program and I realized that I could have an impact on how that company did. I didn't have to just kind of wait and see what happened. I could create an impact. So I came out of that program and started to be an active participant in the company. And within nine months, I was signing the checks. I was the company manager at 19. I, the company had money in the bank. They'd come out of debt. So it was like my one of my first you know, experiences of being able to shift something bigger than me. Like shifting your own beliefs is one thing, but shifting reality is a different kind of sense of power. Not power like, Ugh, but like ability to make things happen. You know? And, and I, wanna, I wanna kind of piggyback on what you're saying a bit because I know that I too have been a victim at some time of limiting beliefs and doubt, not being doubt. uncertain about what you need to do 
but you know you need to go somewhere. You need you want to get to the next level, but something just keeps popping up, and it's more within than without. What I want you to share with us is how did you reach to the point where you actually found a way to put your limiting beliefs aside and then see the fulfillment of what you replace that with and it become a reality? Well, I had a lot of coaches over the years and I think coaching, obviously that's why I'm a coach. I, I think coaching is one of the most valuable things anybody can do in any area where they want to, as you say, move to the next level. It is. Because because ultimately you can't see what you can't see. Yeah. And a coach can see what you can't see. Yeah. So they can tell you sometimes what you don't want to hear That's right. so that you can be who you want to be. So I, you know, was very early. I started transformative workshops when I was 11. I mean, believe it or not. So I started in the mindset of get a coach. You want to have a breakthrough, get a coach. And so coaching has played a big role in my life over the last, you know, 45 years, because I'll be 56 shortly. So 45 years of practicing and developing the muscle of transformative work. So when I had that dream come true about the record deal, I got very committed to not only empowering artists to be able to fulfill their dreams in the entertainment industry. So I started my management company where I manage actors, yeah. but I also got committed to just people being able to be, go beyond their limiting beliefs. And, you know, what if everybody's got a dream? They do. I mean, I've met thousands of people. They all have something that they've given up on. Mm. Something they kind of just decided, well, it's not doable. So I'll just want what I see possible. But if I could have anything, there's that thing, you know, and and I was committed that people have a methodology to do that, which is what I've developed. And that's why I started the art of being unmessable with was to give people access to shifting from that world of sort of survival and reaction and fear to a world of creation and fulfillment and vision. And it's doable. It takes discipline, though, and it takes practice. It's like a muscle. That's right. Wonderful. That's inspirational, Jocelyn. Thanks for sharing. What I want you to look at for us is the fact that there are some people who not only don't know how to trust, but don't know how to open up. And one of the things that you need to understand is if you're getting involved with a coach, two things are important. One, you need to trust the relationship you're now going to develop. And two, you need to open up. Why? Transformation is something that goes deep. As you said, it takes work, it takes discipline. It's not necessarily good looking. Sometimes it's really ugly because yeah. you pick up all the dirt. How do you get people to come to the point where they would say, you know what? Despite the challenges and the insecurities I feel about doing that, this is absolutely necessary for me because there are some things in my life that I need to achieve or else I will not be fulfilled at all. How do you take them to that stage? Well, I think it, it, the answer is different depending on the context in which I'm working with somebody, right? So when somebody hires me as a one-on-one -on -one coach, I mean, they're paying me to do that with them. So I find that they're already sort of willing Yes. to be open and to trust. And, you know, inside of our relationship over a period of time, you know, the trust gets deeper and deeper, you know? So that I think is one thing. In group coaching, which is not quite as much money, so it's less skin in the game, sometimes you have to warm people up and they see other people trusting. So it's kind of like a group phenomenon that really supports people because some people just work better in groups and being able to be held to account and listen to other people sharing to be able to see things about themselves. It's not as confronting if someone else is sharing about it and then you see yourself in it rather than you're on the hot seat, right? And then when I um, lead courses, which have you know lots of people in it, I find it's a very safe space for people because they don't have to speak. They can just be there and absorb and see and take notes and you know see actions that they could take. So I've tried to develop a lot of different inroads 
to be able to impact people. Because my mission is to get to as many people as possible and support them in having their dreams fulfilled and develop their ability to be unmessable with no matter what life throws at them, including those kind of negative conversations that we have with ourselves or doubt. Those are all things that mess with people. One of the most common things that I've discovered in my work with people that messes with them is self-doubt. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's a big monster. It's a huge challenge. It is. But you know, what I found also about trust, Andy, mm -hmm. is if people don't trust whoever, their, their spouse, their boss, their employees, whatever it is, or their coach, it's mostly because they don't trust themselves. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's like life's a full length mirror. And whatever you see, or my, my friend Dennis would say, you spot it, you got it, you know, and it's, it is very much like what's unresolved for yourself that you haven't dealt with, because you don't really distrust people unless you know there's something there where you don't have certainty about your own word yeah. and that's one of the biggest things I work with people on is developing muscle with their words so they can say something and have it happen so trust is a lot different when you have that kind of ability to you know not sell out on your own word you're not as worried as people selling out on their word and honestly people do whatever they do they don't deserve your trust trust is a gift Everybody lies. Everybody doesn't do what they said sometimes. So it's to expect people to be like perfect is insane. I mean, you know, it's like, so then who are you going to be? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Uh, fundamentally, trust is a gift. It's not for any reason. It's not justified. Nobody has like the credibility to be trusted 100% of the time. So that's what, but it just works in relationship. If you don't trust somebody, then your relationship is not gonna work. So what do you want? Which one? Sometimes you'll be burned. Okay, next. It happens, it happens. but it's all part of the process. Um, we, we are currently kind of trying to put um, the negative aspects of COVID-19 in the review mirror <laughs> and let it stay there. But I know of some people who have personally dealt with, who have had, you know, a sort of deja vu moment every time someone mentions the pandemic. And they have suffered with depression, burnout, stuff like that. I know it's a challenge all over the world because this is a global phenomenon. Yes. What are some of the things that the people that you work with share with you with regards to coming out of the pandemic and having to restart, rebuild, rebrand, just get into the thick of things all over again and try to get some semblance of normalcy in their lives. What are some of the challenges mentally, emotionally that they face? Well, as you said, burnout is an epidemic. I mean, talk about a pandemic. I mean, you know, burnout is pretty much reaching those kind of numbers. And I work a lot inside of the world of burnout and how to have that disappear because Burnout mostly is a function of you not being connected to your purpose, to your vision. You know, when you're connected to your vision, you could work 20 hours a day and not be burned out. But when you're just dealing with life and managing what life is throwing at you and surviving, you could be burned out after a 10 hour night of sleep. You know, it's it's really a, an ontological phenomenon. It's a phenomenon of being. It's not a phenomenon of how much rest you get or how much water you drink, although those things obviously help. You know, that's the first thing you need to tend to is fill your tank with gas. Otherwise, you're not getting to Jersey or wherever you're going. But um, I work with people to connect to what they're here for. Like, what is their vision? What is their dream? You'd be shocked how many people are not clear about what they really want because they're so busy dealing with what life is throwing at them. Yep. They don't have time to look up and out. They're looking down and in. So I develop that ability with people. I give them strategies. First, we dismantle what keeps them looking down. And then we give them strategies to move over to the world of creation, which is looking up and out. Exactly. Wonderful. Now, clarity seems to be a big challenge for a whole lot of people. Yes. <laughs> They can't really explain what is my why? What is the vision for your life? What is your purpose? What is your destiny? Why are you here? They need clarification. In terms of someone at the helm of a business and they are the leader of the business, they are the CEO, they're in charge and they need to express a certain level of emotional intelligence. 
to deal with communicating with their staff, their support workers, whoever is in the, in, in the sphere or the realm of what they're doing. What are some of the key pointers that you would give to them so that the communication that comes from them is compassionate, empathetic, and one that gives the individuals who are receiving the communication the idea that, you know what, although this person is my boss, they really do care. And it's a sense of comfort. It's a sense of motivation for them to show up and get the job done. What are some of the key pointers you would give to CEOs in a similar situation? Well, a lot of the people I work with are CEOs, founders, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, and I even have a partnership with two very dear colleagues of decades uh, called Mission B, and we do work inside of companies. Right. And we work to have not only the founder or the executives be connected to their purpose, but have the company's intent yeah. Like what you would normally call a mission, which a lot of times is not really a mission. It's like an outcome. Right. So they're the ultimate intent of the company be an expression of their personal vision. So they can see themselves fulfilling their personal purpose through the company. Now, that's one thing for the executive level, right? Mm -hmm. But unless the people that work for you can see the company's intent as an opportunity for them to express their personal purpose, you're going to have turnover, you're going to have burnout. It's just, that's the way that goes. So one of the things I work with people on is making sure that the people in their company are connected to their personal purpose, because that literally reduces burnout, increases productivity by like 175%, some studies have shown. So being connected to what I would call your, your creation source, your dream source, your vision, your purpose, your calling, your raison d'etre, however you call it, keeps you in that world of creation, no matter what you're doing. So as a CEO, you got to get interested in what are your people up to? Like, what is their vision? And sometimes you're going to find out that their vision isn't a match for your company's intent and they might want to leave. And you know what? good, go leave, fulfill your purpose. That's what you want for people. You don't want people working at a job where they're just getting a paycheck and getting through the day. That's not going to be a recipe for a high performance team. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. The word that I, you know, that keeps coming out to me as you're speaking is alignment. Mm. Uh, <laughs> if you can find alignment between the, sh the two shared values, then you have synergy. And you could take that and make something dynamic for that company, that organization. Totally. I want you to think about, let's say hypothetically, a single mom. And she has found herself out of work, maybe because of the pandemic scenario. But she has some skills, she has some talent. And she needs to know what is my next move because... I'm a single mom, I've got kids to take care of, I've got bills to pay at the end of the month. It's a challenge for me, but I need to know how do I position myself and go into the world of work or maybe start a business? What kind of guidance would you say you would give to someone like that? And they are hungry and thirsting for a way to get to the next level. How do you deal with situations like that? Well, the first thing I would ask that person, but this is the first thing I would ask anybody is, okay, well, what do you really want? What's your vision? If you weren't limited by your circumstances or by what you think you're capable of or what you think you have access to in terms of resources, what would you create if you could create anything? So I get a sense of really what they want. And then we can look to see, okay, what are the actions that would have you fulfill on that or move you closer to fulfilling on that one step at a time. And sometimes what you discover with people is they have like a, a limiting story about themselves. You know, they don't really get who they really are and what they're capable of. So I have with a few clients had them write a formulation statement, like not a bio necessarily, but sort of like a bio where they include all the accomplishments and, you know, accolades and all the people they've worked with. And, you know, I, I was working with somebody who was a, like a retreat leader. She did retreats for people and she kind of had this imposter syndrome sort of thing going on, which, 
you know, a lot of people deal with and suffer with. So I had her write this, you know, bio where I was like, well, how many people have you worked with? And she's like, well, who am I? How do I, you know, why am I somebody that people would pay to do this? And I'm like, well, how many of these retreats have you been on? And she, it was like dozens and dozens. And I said, how many years have you been doing? Well, it's probably 15 years. I was like, oh, really? And how many people have you worked with? Thousands of people. I was like, okay, write those bullets down and now pretend it's not you. Yeah. Write a bio, write an introduction. To that person. Right. And it was like mind blowing because that's not how she sees herself, but that's reality. So we don't often see ourselves, people, life from reality. We see it through the lens that we have that colors our view of reality. And if we have a story about ourselves, like we're not smart enough or we're not good enough, which most people have some version of an enough story, that colors your view of yourself, which colors your ability to take action. Uh huh. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing, Justin. I just want to share something with you right now, and I will get. I'd like to get your comments on it. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Sure. And I'm gonna lodge, and boom. You know, in my work with people over the last thirty years on being able to live the life of their dreams, one of the things I've seen is the top thing that messes with them is they're not even clear about what their dreams are and what they really want. And this is very common, especially if you're a very successful person who's very effective at dealing with what life is throwing at, at you. You know, you can get things done. You're effective at getting, you know, whatever's coming at you, you handled. But the muscle of being the creator of life is weakened. You're a master reactor. You get stuff done. You react to what life is throwing at you. But creating your vision and what you really, really, really want is weakened. And what, that's what I do with people. I work with them to develop the muscle of creation so that they're not a reaction to life, but more creating life moment to moment to moment. And that is the experience of being unmessable with. So if any of this resonated with you, my beta course of the foundation for being unmessable with might be right for you. So you should check out the link in my bio and hope to see you in the beta. It starts October 11th. Okay, great. I was oh. like, where'd you find that? That's an old post, but okay. <laughs> uh, I know you shared a little bit on it earlier on. Yeah. I recall, but that particular video goes way deeper because what you're doing, explaining the core foundation of what you do and the unmessable wit aspect of it just comes flowing out. Just touch a little more on it, please, because I think folks need to hear a lot more about this. Well, when I say unmessable with, sometimes people think that's I'm going to be tough or I'm going to suppress my emotion. That's not what it means at all. Right. It's about being able to, no matter what circumstance you're dealing with, like the single mother who lost her job mm -hmm. or like, you know, somebody like my mother had a stroke or broke her hip or, you know, dealing with dementia or, you know, whatever the circumstances, you get a health scare, you know, you have a biopsy that's, you know, questionable. How do you in those moments be somebody who isn't going to go down the road of reaction, isn't going to get hooked, isn't going to get thwarted or go down for the count, but able to stand in your vision and what you really want and act from there, from a creative space. And what I've found is with very successful people, they're really good at reacting to stuff because stuff is happening all the time, right? And they have to get it done. And, and that in many cases atrophies the muscle of creation. So while to the outside world, it seems like, oh my God, those people are amazing. They can handle anything, right? They know they're not, there's no magic in it. The magic is in the world of creation. And we sometimes, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this. We'll start a project or maybe when you started this, this show, you know, it was like, you didn't really know what you were doing. You were just creating and it was kind of exciting. And even your failures were sort of like invigorating. But then whatever you create, and this goes for business, a project, or even a relationship, right? Shifts over to this world of like managing. So now you've got to book guests and make sure that the links work and da, 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 da. And you're now managing your creation, which has you then look down and start dealing with things versus up and out, 
creating from a vision. So I work with people to develop their muscle of creation being unmessable with and weaken the muscle of being unmessable with because there's just so many opportunities to be messable with during the day. I mean, somebody goes boo and you could go down that road, you know? Yeah, wonderful. Thanks for sharing. I just want to take a look and see if we have any comments that need to be addressed at this time. Okay, great. So, wow. People may be so intrigued that they have no comments. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know what? I, I probably have a little surprise here for you. Let me see how this goes. Uh-oh. She said, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> that was a 30 year blast from the past. <laughs> what kind of no, no, I should say the word is nostalgic feeling did you get? And I'm the coach now. So where did you, okay. feel, where did you feel it in your body? Yeah, mostly it's in my eyes and my chest where I just have such a fond relationship to that period of time in my life because every day was like the next dream fulfilled, you know, being on Friday night videos or, you know, performing at a, at a venue that had, you know, 50,000 people at it and them lighting, you know, lighters. I mean, back then we used to have lighters. Now we have phones, but, you know, lighters during one of the ballads or, you know, being on early morning radio shows, it was just a magical, magical time. Yeah. Uh, Jocelyn, you had, I mean, the among the people that I see you've worked with here, it's truly amazing in terms of uh, Hollywood and, and the film industry and stuff. Um, let me just call out a few here. I'm seeing, well, programs really. Bluebuds, yeah, The Big C, Boardwalk, Empire, Homeland, The Newsroom, Spider-Man, The Following, The Americans, Brooklyn's Finest, Sex and the City, that stands out. Precious. Ugly Betty, we looked at that. Mercy, Gossip Girl Kings, Cashman Mafia, and the list goes on and on and on. What was it like working with these people? And what were the challenges, if any, that you face? Well, who I work with are the actors that end up being on those shows. So I, I've been representing actors for more than 25 years. And what's so great about representing actors is, especially in, in my business, you know, in my company, I focus on developing people. So I get them at the beginning a lot of times. And I get to see them through years of development and booking their first TV show or their first series regular or their first Broadway show. And it's very exciting to see somebody have a dream come true like that. That. And, you know, I've represented people that ended up winning Golden Globes. I mean, beyond past when they were with me, but like I birthed them, you know, I got, I got them right out of college and then I see them now and I'm like, I'm so proud of them and so happy for them because it's like they've really been able to take what they developed and blossom it. Wonderful. And you were once nominated for an Independent Spirit Award for Best Feature Under 500K. Wow. What did you do? I produced a movie called Anne Be Real uh, with a couple of partners of mine. And it was a story of a young girl who reads the diary of Anne Frank and she dreams to get out of the ghetto and she uses her rapping like Anne Frank uses her her writing to kind of escape from the circumstances that she's in. It was a really moving film. And what I'm very proud of is, you know, while it was an urban film, it did not have one foul piece of language in the entire film. So it was a real expression of passion for all of us. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Justin. Truly amazing stuff. So 
in terms of the future for yourself, your company, the work that you do, what are your plans going for? What are some of the things that you are looking forward to accomplish, to achieve more dreaming? <laughs> Oh. Yes, more more dreaming. Well, I mean, my one-on-one -on -one coaching practice is almost pretty full. You know, there's only so many hours that I can spend coaching people, which I love doing. So I'd like that to continue. I want to keep uh, delivering courses. So the beta test that I talked about in that clip, which was last year, I just did a pilot version of creating the foundation for being unmessable with. And this summer, I'm going to release the recorded version. So anybody can do it anytime they want. And it's like a five-week course. I'd love to get that out there and then design the next next level, the advanced version of that, that I could deliver maybe at the end of the year or the beginning of next year. And, you know, really just keep continuing to develop products and services and offers that can support people in fulfilling on what they want and beating burnout and disappearing overwhelm and all of that, because a lot of that is what messes with us. And I really am firmly of the belief you do not need to go through life being reactivated by things you can shift that yeah. and it does take practice but you know so what what else are you going to do <laughs> you know? yeah that's powerful Jocelyn thanks for sharing so but you're a wife and a mother of three how do you manage what you do professionally and at the same time balance what you do as a wife and a mother and I guess I can look at it in the in the in the aspect of how does all the good stuff that you help people to develop assist you in the personal management of your family life, your, your husband and your children? Well, first of all, people sometimes say to me, well, my God, how do you do all those things? I mean, there's so many different things. I don't look at it as different things. It's all under one roof for me, which is fulfilling dreams and being unmessable. So that's the overarching context for everything I do. You know, my family is remarkable. Um, my kids are 17, almost 21 and almost 27. So they're, you know, grown, but you know, I have parents that are 90 and 92 that I take care of quite a bit. And, okay. you know, we're able to, as a team, because while it's possible to have it all, it's not possible to do it all. Yeah. So you have to be able to make requests and have people function as a team around you. Otherwise, how are you going to do anything worth doing mm -hmm. if you're the only one who can do it? You know, so my kids are a team. You know, I've got one of them does the dishes. The other one takes out the garbage. The other one, you know, does the cat litter, whatever. They just they function as we're all in this together, which if you go out bigger beyond the level of family in the world, we are all in this together, even though we don't act like it. If you turn on the news, but you know, one person's actions do impact everybody's. I mean, what's happening in China is impacting us and what's happening in India. And it's just, you know, we can't live in a silo like it's only, and people live in a silo, like I have to get this done. So I also work with people to train them in making requests. You have to make requests if you're going to, you know, be able to accomplish big things. And I am somebody who makes a lot of requests. Okay. So that's how I, how I am able to manage it all. Okay, great. Now, you have had the opportunity, um, I, I wouldn't use the term good fortune because I think what you accomplished, you earned it. You were specific, you were clear about your vision, your dreams, what you want to accomplish, and you're still doing that. There are some people who may have reached 40%, 30%, maybe even 50%, 60%, and they stop. Yes. I know you've dealt with people like that. What are some of the things that people can do to rekindle that fire and to get back on the path to achieving those dreams that they know, those goals that they know in the heart of heart, I gotta get it done. I need to do it. What are some yeah. of the things you say to them? Well, the first thing I would say, and I don't wanna be flippant, I would say get a coach. You know, However you do that, get a coach because you're not gonna, look, you haven't done it so far. Yeah. So what's going to be different? Okay. You know, you need somebody to support you. And even if it's like a friend who's an accountability partner, and so you make promises about certain actions you're going to take, the whole thing about fulfilling any dream is actions. If you don't take actions, nothing's happening. It doesn't matter how much you believe or don't believe. Even if you don't believe and you take the actions, you're going to produce results. So it's not about believing in yourself or believing in the dream. It's about what are you doing or not doing that's hindering the fulfillment of that goal 
or advancing the fulfillment of that goal. So actions are key. But I would say, unless you're really connected to what your purpose is, what I and I, I do have a little program, a five-day thing to help you get connected to that called your the dream source discovery, where you get connected to what is the source of your dreams? What's your why? And what messes with you? And how are you going to bridge those two worlds? So However you do it, whether it's with me or somebody else, you just got to find somebody who can walk you through that or discover it, it'll take longer if you want to do it yourself. It took me 40 years. So you might as well save some time and just steal what I did. You know? Start right where you are. At, right? Exactly. Don't don't reinvent the wheel. Just yeah. do what I did. It works. All right. So here's the thing, Jocelyn. I want you to imagine that you have this grand megaphone. And you can speak to the world almost 8 billion people, I think. And we have so many situations that when we turn on the media, it's like, oh man, that again. Yeah. It's political, it's economical, it's war here, rumors of war there. And it, it's just not pleasant. But imagine you're the voice of hope and you could say something to people that would, you know, turn them away from all that negative media distraction and at least focus on something that can make a difference, can bring some meaning and value to their lives. Mm. What would you say to them? I would say that you can shift war from being profitable to peace being profitable, whether wow. it's at the level of country or you and your mother-in-law, That's because possible. arguing costs yeah. and peace is profitable. Yes. Amazing. I love that. So I have one comment I'm seeing here. Let me just, and it's Loretta Packett. She says, bless morning to you all. Very interesting program. I'm learning a lot. Hey, you know, oh, if great. we make the difference in one person's life. Loretta's the one today. That's it. That's good enough. So we have just about two minutes to go. Uh, Jocelyn, this has been a firebrand sort of episode. Amazing stuff. And I want you to share with the audience, your social hashtag handles, tell them where they can make contact with you. They need your coaching experiences. They need you to speak on burnout, whatever. Just share it with them so they can make. Well, absolutely. My website is the art of being unmessable with. Dot com. And there you can find everything. I mean, on Facebook, I'm be unmessable with on Instagram be unmessable with, but the website has all the links to everything. And it also has free resources for people, free five-day games, inexpensive ways to kind of download programs that can support people in fulfilling their dreams and all the upcoming events that I'm, I'm dealing with. So go there. That's the easiest way. Great. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. So I'm just going to do a little trivia with you and it's, you know, it's either or, and you tell me which one you choose and why? Okay. Sunday evening baseball or Sunday night football? <laughs> and I have to choose one? Just one. <laughs> Sunday evening baseball because it will put me to sleep. <laughs> and then I'll have a nice night's sleep. <laughs> wow. Okay. I fell asleep at a live baseball game once, okay? Really? <laughs> yes. Okay. That's I'm a, a basketball girl, you know. Ah, yeah, yeah, the NBA. Okay, great. Playoffs are moving ahead. What's your team? Who are you supporting? The Knicks. I'm in New York, you know. Okay, I get that. But, you know. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. But it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next one is about nutrition. Maybe a just choice or maybe something from your childhood days. Peanut butter and jelly or ham and cheese? Ooh, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, that was quick. Why? I'll, I'll tell you why. Because on my wedding day, uh -huh. I didn't eat at the wedding. You know, you're busy at the wedding, whatever. And so we went to the hotel, which we were very excited to go to this hotel. And I said, I'll just get room service at the hotel. And the chef was sick. Ooh. So they couldn't give us any food. And I was starving. And I was I was pregnant at the time. I was like, you know, eight weeks pregnant. So I was start, you're a hungry pregnant woman. You do not want to mess with that person. Right. So my husband went down to the kitchen and made peanut butter jelly sandwiches in this fancy schmance hotel. They let us in and we had glasses of milk and peanut and butter jelly sandwiches. And then every year for a number of years, we had those on our anniversary just to celebrate our wedding. 
Wonderful. That's an amazing memory. A wonderful. <laughs> Goodness. Thank you so much. Well, we have come to the end of our episode. And uh, wow, Loretta says again, so true. Dreams don't come true if you do not put in the action. See, she's getting it. She's getting That's it. That's great. That's great. Wonderful. So good to know that we can make contact with people and they can get the value of what we are doing and sharing. That's amazing. So folks, it has been a wonderful episode and we want to thank Justin for coming on and sharing nuggets of value, great content for our lives, our businesses, our hopes, our dreams that we look forward to going forward. So this is Andy of Andy's Personal Development from the Breakout Room saying thank you so much. Godspeed to all of you guys. Remember the three watchwords, health, happiness, and prosperity. Seek for those in everything that you do in your life. Until next time, this is Andy together with my guest, Justin saying so long, Godspeed, shalom, namaste. Bye for now. Hold on a minute, Justin. <laughs>